Welcome, everyone. So nice to have you here. The, uh, and we also especially are glad for you taking the opportunity to think ahead, to prepare for something which we don't think will happen to us, but apparently does happen to everyone, you know, our death. The, um, um, there was a famous author who uh, was writing about um, you know, planning, you know, for your, your final, final pl uh, plans. And they said people are always very hesitant. I can't remember her name right now, but people are very hesitant to, uh, to begin the conversation. And so they, she found an anecdote that says, talking about sex does not make you pregnant, and talking about your funeral does not make you dead. So I, with, it, with apologies to anyone who thinks that perhaps that's profane, but I, I thought it was a good analogy. And especially I've seen children, oh, by, I should tell you, I'm Father Bowen, by the way. Up until now, I've been the pastor of this church. <laughs> the, uh, but we're happy to see you. Anybody here is not Catholic, because we opened up the whole community. And, and non-Catholics will die too. It's a reason why we just want to. But there's a part that comes after this, which specifically gets into with our liturgical coordinator, Eileen. The, um, you know, some of the things with the Catholic funerals. So um, I want to thank you because we have had a lot of experience when people die, parents die, and the children don't have a clue, and no plans have been made. And not only are then caught with the grief and the loss of someone who has always been there, but they then also sometimes get into some very animated conversations that can become very divisive and painful um, at a time where you're looking for healing and, and closure because people will say, this isn't what mom would want or this isn't what dad would want. Um, and so now there's a lot more options as well today, so there's even more things to consider. Anyway, having said all that, to thank you for being part of this process, which helps to bring peace and, and, and helps to make a very difficult time, but a time will come to all of us, you know, one of uh, less distress and more solid um, certainty with regard to this is what mom or dad would want. This is the commendation of the parting soul. This was used to be read in Latin back in the days before the church changed into English, and it was, it, 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 it was such a wonderful, wonderful uh, prayer. I thought I would just start with this. Commendo te onipotenti Deo, carissim, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Dearest sister, I commend you to Almighty God, and I entrust you to him who created you so that when by your dying you have paid the debt to which every person is subject, you may return to your maker, to him who formed you from the clay of the earth. And then when your soul goes forth from your body, this is the part I love, may the radiant company of angels come to meet you. May the assembly of the apostles, our judges, welcome you. May the victorious army of white-robed martyrs meet you on your way. And may the glittering throng of confessors, bright as lilies, gather about you. May the glorious choir of virgins receive you. May the patriarchs enfold you in the embrace of blessed peace. And may St. Joseph, beloved patron of the dying, raise you high in hope. And may the Holy Mother of God, the Virgin Mary, lovingly turn her eyes toward you. And then, gentle and joyful, May Christ Jesus appear before you to assign you a place forever among those who stand in his presence. Isn't that a lovely prayer? Well, God bless you all. Thank you for coming. Who should I introduce? Eileen? Eileen? I'll let you, I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Eileen Kiefer. I think most of you, if I look around, know me. Uh, I've been a member of St. John's for over 40 years and um, have been working in the resurrection ministry for a good part of that time. And this afternoon, uh, our opening speaker is going to be Patrick 
I forget your last name, Thompson, sorry, Patrick Thompson with Slack Funeral Home in Ellicott City. And he will go over all choices in terms of your funeral arrangements and answer any questions at the end of his presentation. Thank you. Thank you all for having me today. Um, funeral planning is not something that people often want to have that conversation with anybody, but it's important that you do. Um, one of the things we always say at our funeral home is that you don't have to plan your funeral with a funeral home ahead of time, but you need to make sure that your loved ones at least know what you want, because there are so many different options of things that, you can, that can happen. Um, a lot of people will say, well, you know, I, I, I know I want this or I know I don't want this, but they don't ever tell their loved ones. And then we get to the point of they've passed away and their children are sitting with us and we'll say, well, what did mom or dad want? And they'll say, well, I don't know. They wouldn't talk about it with us. And then parent, kids are feeling guilty. Is this really what, what anybody wanted? Um, so they kind of go with what they want. There are lots of options with funeral planning. Um, most people think of burial and cremation, and that they think those are the only two options. Um, I want to real quickly touch on something else that a lot of people don't think about, and that's donating your body to science, because sometimes people will say something about that, and then it's very last minute, and they're trying to, they think, you know, oh my gosh, what do we have to do with this? In the state of Maryland, if you want to donate your body to science, it's done through the anatomy board, and you have to make those arrangements while you are living. So if that is something that you thought of, that you know, you'd want that, and then a memorial mass later, um, you need to make those arrangements ahead of time. The other options, of course, are burial and cremation. And there's even options there. A lot of people, of course, are familiar with visitation in a funeral home, and then you've come, you come to the church for your mass, and you go to the cemetery. Um, this church changed that around a lot because a lot of times we do visitation right here. Um, that's not always an option, but if it, sometimes people want that. People also will think, well, I want cremation, but I want to have my body present during the services. That is absolutely something that can happen. Um, there's lots of options with, you know, doing a service and then the cremation to take place later. Um, when you do with when you're dealing with burial of course then you have the also you have to deal with a cemetery so some people will think well okay i know there's cemeteries in the area i want to go to um, some people again don't know where to start so with cemeteries you've got then there's always the question are you a veteran or is your spouse a veteran because if you are you could qualify for one of the veteran cemeteries um, Real quickly to touch base on that, veterans are, of course, given the spot for free as well as their spouse. There is some fees that are associated when the spouse is buried. And then you have, but you have national veteran cemeteries and you have state ones. And to qualify for the state ones, you have to have lived within that state for a certain amount of time. Um, here in Maryland, the state ones are in Crownsville or in Garrison Forest. Um, there's also one in out in Western Maryland, I want to say it's in Rocky Gap, and there's one on the Eastern Shore, as well as one in Prince George's County. But most of the people that live in this area go to either Crownsville or Garrison Forest if they're going to be buried in the veteran cemeteries. Um, if you're not a veteran, you want to be buried, then you think of other cemeteries, and there's, that's where the funeral home can help you. There's really large ones, there's some very small ones. It's just sort of a personal preference. Um, if you're going to be cremated, though, what's going to happen with your cremated remains after? Do you want the cremated remains buried in a cemetery? Do you want your loved one to hold on to them? People will often say, well, I want to be scattered here and there, and I will let you know if you want to be scattered in the state of Maryland. There's a letter that we have to give every family that talks about where you can and cannot legally be scattered. So that's not just always something that's... People think of this beautiful moment from a movie where the family's gathered at the beach, that's not at all what it looks like. That is against the law. And your family looks like a bunch of teenagers doing something wrong in Ocean City. Um, so that's not, it's not that beautiful moment that you're, you picture from the movies. Um, when you get back to, though, with, with the actual um, 
going back to what you want during your services, though, one of the biggest questions is visitation. And do you want people to see your body or not? It's a personal preference. Um, a lot of funeral homes will require embalming if you are going to have an open casket visitation. Generally, the law says that embalming is not required. Uh, but the funeral homes have the right to require it for an open, open casket services. So if you are going to have a visitation that's open, then you would need to have embalming if that is the funeral home's policy. Um, people also get into questions about caskets because there is a wide range of caskets. There is anything from cloth covered to solid mahogany. My, the owner of our funeral home has a saying that there is not a casket or an urn that we sell that will get you into or keep you out of heaven. It is a personal preference. And that's exactly what it is, um, a personal preference. Some people say, well, we know that mom loved her cherry wood. She, that was everything, all the furniture, all the cabinets, they were all cherry. That's what we want to do. Other families say, mom told us to be very thrifty and we want to go with something that will meet the requirements and that's all we want. And that's, they're all perfectly good options. Um, in the folders I gave that I, we, the funeral home put together for you, there's a lot of information in there. Um, the ones that are just sort of loose papers, that's just things that we figured people were gonna, gonna have questions about. So we put in our price list because that's one of the things people always say is, what's, what are the prices? That's just to give you guys an idea of pricing. Um, there's also a form in there that talks about the, it has your vitals, it says, it says vital records at the top. That is a form that no matter what funeral home you would select, that's some of the questions they're gonna ask you. And the vitals part is for completing the death certificate. And then the rest of it is usually for completing death notices or obituaries. So that is something that some people like to have filled out so that way their kids have it for them. Then there are two booklets that are on the other side that are both done in blue. Um, one of them just talks about your different options with burial and cremation. The other one is a, a spot where you can record information. So again, it's a lot of the, the vitals that you would record, but there's also a spot that you can record, I had a will done and this is the lawyer who did our will. Um, I've talked to the church and here's who I talked to at the church and these are some of the, the, the hymns that we've picked out or the readings we've picked out. And one thing I, like to, I just like to say to a family is, if you are dealing with the church don't just assume because you saw something done at a different church one way that it's done at that church the exact same way. There are some things that are different with each church, so I always recommend talking to the church to make sure that that is what they allow. Um, I said earlier that we've done a lot of visitations here. There are some churches that we know we would never do a visitation in their sanctuary space. They just they don't allow that. Um, we've been fortunate here at St. John's that they've always allowed us to do visitations here. Um, that could change, I guess, with a different priest, um, but so far we've always been lucky that that's been allowed. Um, one of the, but the biggest and the most important thing is just that you at least have a conversation with your family about what you do and don't want, and so just at least give them some ideas. One of the other things, though, that you can do is you can pre-plan with a funeral home. The main advantage to pre-planning with a funeral home, is, with, with most reason that people do is when they prepay with the funeral home, is because if you prepay with a funeral home and you end up in a long-term care facility and have to apply for Medicaid, that money is protected from Medicaid being able to, t or the facility being able to take that money for your care. So that does not count against Medicaid. That's often when we find people will come to us is that their loved one is in a long-term care facility and they're, they're running out of money and so that they're getting ready to have to apply for Medicaid. So they'll, apply, they'll set up a pre-funded funeral with us. And then that way it's protected. When you are set, if you do get to the point that you want to set up a pre-funded funeral 
with a funeral home, there are some questions you'd want to ask. And you want to know what part of your contract is guaranteed and if there's any parts that are non-guaranteed. They have to tell you what it is guaranteed and what is not. So our funeral home, and I, I'm just using this as an example because it's what I know, we guarantee our services and our goods. So if you pre-plan a funeral with us today, those prices, if you live another 20 years, there you don't owe anything extra for those goods and services. The non-guaranteed contracts, if you pre-plan and those prices go up another $5,000 before you pass away, you would owe the additional $5,000. Um, most of the funeral homes that do guaranteed contracts will guarantee their goods and services and they won't guarantee things that they consider cash advance items. So cash advance items are things like your death certificates, your honorarium to the church, your um, death notices in the newspapers, uh, any cemetery charges. Those are the non-guaranteed parts. Um, some, some of the cemeteries will also do this, so you can actually guarantee your cemetery parts by pay, setting up a pre-need with them directly, and it just depends on the cemetery. Um, I know I've thrown a lot of information really quickly. Is there any questions right now before I, before I move on, because I know... I just have one comment. When we were planning for my mother, you know, we found out you just can't get your tree mail. You just can't mail you, the uh, cremating places. There are, there are laws that, that restrict how you transport cremated remains. Yes, this, that was uh, just speaking about with cremated remains and with transportation of them. Um, the only way cremated remains can be mailed at this point or, or transported through a courier service is the US Postal Service. And they have to fit into a very specific box. So most urns do not fit into that box. There's um, basically a standard urn that does and it has to be marked and they usually only can go funeral home to funeral home. Um, generally the the uh, Postal Service won't make an exception to that. So yeah, if you are transporting cremated remains, you, there is that. Now if a family is transporting cremated remains themselves, uh, if you're gonna be flying, the funeral home can give you a letter. Usually that is enough for the, airport, uh, the airlines, but as security keeps changing, that, is, that could possibly change as well. And burial in a different location is a big thing because of the way that so many people move to this area for, for work. Um, that is, of course, not a problem. What you, what you would do is you would have a funeral home here in Maryland and then a funeral home wherever you are going back to um, that would work with you. And so we've had some families that they've lived here for a number of years and they just, you know, they're going to do everything here and it's just going to be a simple graveside service. We have some families that do a service here and then we'll have visitation back at um, where they used to live because they haven't been gone that long. Um, you would pick your, I would, my recommendation would be is if you do have a funeral home you wanna work with on both sides, you can pick both. If not, if there's either here or wherever you're going back to, you have a funeral home that you know you'd wanna work with then if you pick one, the other one can usually help you find a second one. Um, a, lot of, a lot of funeral directors are involved with different organizations. So I, my, my, the owner of our funeral home is involved with one that is all family-owned funeral homes. So we usually will look for a family-owned funeral home that we know in that area. But it is completely and becoming more and more um, something that we're seeing where parts of the service are done in one state and the other parts are done in another state. I live in Montgomery County and I've, I've wondered how, how, who do they contact first? Who does the family contact? And how, and you have to get a, a funeral home in Montgomery County, transfer back up here? 
No, no. So, um, in, if you're within the same state, it's not, there's family, people can cross lines, or the funeral homes can cross lines, and that's not a problem. Um, once you're getting into crossing state lines, there can sometimes be issues about whether or not the funeral home has a director who is licensed in each state. Um, but if you, so when somebody passes away, the question of who do you contact, a lot of that depends on where somebody passes away at. If you, if you die in a hospital, of course, then the family can go ahead and call the funeral home directly, and the funeral home will initiate contact with the hospital. Um, if you die in hospice care or in a nursing home, there's nurses that are able to um, pronounce somebody as deceased so that then the family can contact the funeral home. If somebody is not under hospice care and dies at their house, Unfortunately, 911 has to be called because there has to be, somebody has to pronounce the person as deceased. And in the state of Maryland, we don't have the coroner system, so funeral directors don't do that. Um, so it's paramedics that would do it in that situation. Um, I, would rec I would also say that if a nurse in a facility, whether it be a hospice or a nursing home or a hospital, says, oh, we'll call the funeral home for you, it's still a good idea to have somebody in the family contact the funeral home. Sometimes they get very busy and it slips their mind and it's not intentional, but it just happens. And then a family gets upset because why hasn't the funeral home called us and the funeral home doesn't know. So it's better to have two calls to the funeral home than no call at all and the family get upset because, I mean, emotions are already running high at that point. So the question is, if cremation um, takes place, do we do you do a, can you do a visitation with cremated with the urn before the service? Again, I would go back and, and recommend that you talk to the church. Each, each church would be different. Um, Eileen would speak, I think, a little bit about whether or not that would be allowed here, and I and I'm looking at Eileen, assuming that it would be. Um, most churches will allow that. What usually becomes a little bit more of a sticking point with churches is there are some churches that they don't open the casket once you're inside the church. And that's generally why with the casket, casket services that we see more, that there are some churches that just don't allow it. Um, it's not as much of a problem as it was 20 years ago with churches. More of them have come around to saying that it is okay. Um, because families do want to do everything in one location. But anytime you're dealing with the church, I just always recommend that we at least call the church and, and ask that question to make sure it's okay. And just to follow up, is it in general uh, less costly in both the visitation and funeral mass here as opposed to having the visitation of the funeral hall and then coming here for the funeral mass? Overall, I would imagine that it's less costly to have both here, right? So that question was about cost when you're doing the, the visitation here. Um, yes, it is less costly to do everything at the church. Um, it just, I'm going to say for our funeral home, it would be less costly. Our funeral home just does everything where you, choose, you select what you want. There are some funeral homes that do packages. So they may say, well, we, this would still fall under this package, so it'll be the same. But that would just be a question you would ask, which with whatever funeral home you feel comfortable with. Yes, ma'am. So this question is if they're prearranged in another state and then pass away here, how does it work? 
Um, so if you're not doing any services here and it's just a matter of transporting the body back, then you don't have to purchase a whole other casket. There is, um, it's from the casket companies, but they have basically something that we're able to put somebody in to transport them. So no, you do not have to purchase a whole another casket just to be transported to another state. The exception to that is if you die in a foreign country and have to be transported back. Because once you get, start crossing with countries, there are certain countries that require um, what you have to be placed in to be transported in or out of their country. What you could also do is there's what's considered a rental casket. And we do this often with families who are doing cremation. And what this is, is, is this is families who want to have want to have the body present during services, but want to be cremated. And they don't want to purchase a casket because that casket would ultimately just go into the, the crematory retort and, and that would be the end of it. So there are caskets that the entire inside comes out and it's just the shell of the casket. So you could do, the, fa the um, funeral home would talk with you, your family to see if that would be something. So that would be an option as well. Yes, ma'am. If you pick a, a funeral home, do you have to take all their services? Like, there's a, a group of migrants or a mission station, plain, plain um, pine pot casket from the monastery. Can, can you do that and, and just get the rest of the services from there? This is, do you have to do everything? Does everything have to come from one funeral home? Um, no. No, we, there, and I, there's a group of monks, and I'm sure that we're probably speaking of the same ones, and their name is slipping my... Trappist. Trappist. Trappist caskets um, that is built by the, by the monks in Iowa, I want to say it is. And so we have a lot of families that want that. And so they will come in and they'll say, we need you to do everything but the casket. We're getting the casket elsewhere. That is absolutely allowed. As crazy as this sounds, you can buy caskets from Walmart and Costco as well. Um, and a funeral home has to accept them. They, that is part of the law. They cannot tell you, no, you have to purchase the casket from us. What they can say to you is if you're pre-planning and you say, well, I want to purchase the casket and I want you to store it, they can tell you, no, that we're, we don't have storage. Um, they can ask that the family have a representative at the funeral home when it's delivered to make sure that it is not damaged. They can tell the family that they would purchase that directly and have it shipped to the funeral home because the funeral home won't put that on their bill. So they will do things like that, but you can absolutely purchase your own casket um, and not go through the funeral home. The other thing, real quickly, just speaking on caskets, is before you purchase a casket from the funeral home or before you sign a contract, you have to be shown all of the prices. So if you have not been shown the prices and they've got you signing a contract, you, can, you, you should stop then and ask to see the prices because they are required to show you all of the prices. I thought there was a... So that question was, can you purchase the urn ahead of time? Um, so that, and yes, you can. You absolutely can. Um, we have had families come in and one spouse picks out the urn for the other one and they think, they said, you know what, I really like it. I don't want to risk this urn not being made when I pass away. And they'll go ahead and purchase two at that time. Um, we've had people come in who have had their cremations handled by somebody else or 
the body was donated to science and the family's requested to cremate it remains back and they just need an urn and they'll come and just purchase an urn. Absolutely, you can do that. You would just call a funeral home and they would go over, um, they would show you what they have available. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the other thing, and the reason that I gave you all priceless also, is funeral homes are, they're heavily regulated. We're regulated by the federal, state, and local government. And the federal government, one of the, reg one of the requirements is, is that if you go into any funeral home in the United States of America and say, I'd like to see a copy of your price list, they need to stop having the convers any conversations with you and hand you a price list. That's what the law says. Um, it's been that way since the early 80s. And, and so basically you have to be given a price list as soon as you ask for it. And there are secret FTC shoppers that go into funeral homes and just say, I'd like to see a copy of your price list and just see how the funeral homes do it. Um, all of the funeral homes in this area, I mean, they're all wonderful. So they're all not, I'm not concerned with that with around here. And so, you know, when it comes to selecting a funeral home, the biggest thing is just what you're comfortable with. That funeral home that feels right for you and your family. Um, there's lots of options in this area. But if you do decide that you want to do a little price shopping with funeral homes and you ask for a copy of the price list, they have to give it to you, to you. And it is not weird to do price shopping with funeral homes anymore. We have lots of families that do that now. Sure, the question is on organ donation. Um, generally, a lot of that depends on how a person passes away. And living legacy here in the state of Maryland um, is who handles the organ donation. And I can't really tell you what the requirements are for them because that's, that's their portion. But as far as with the funeral home, that does not impact anything we do. We're still able to do open casket visitations with people that select organ donation. Um, if you are doing an open casket with embalming, there is, I will tell you, the fee is a little bit higher just because it does require a little bit more for the embalmer um, when organ donation has taken place. But if you, wanna, if you want organ donation, that does not mean that you cannot have open casket visitation still. The time for organ donation, it is um, immediate after death, and that's why sometimes it just, I don't like to get into their specifics because I don't know enough, um, but generally it's people that have passed away in hospital settings, um, and then they've, they will talk to the family over what organs the family would want donated. Um, you can do organ donation and specify that there are certain things you don't want. Um, not trying to get too graphic, but organ donation can be anything from simply the corneas to long bone, so your femur and, and, or your, um, the arm bones, and to even skin. Um, but even with those, living legacy makes sure that those bodies are still able to be open casket visitation. So this question is about prices of funeral homes on their website. It's up to the individual funeral homes. That is not required. Um, I know that I know ours are on our website. I know um, there's another funeral home in Ellicott City. Theirs are on their website. Um, I don't know if any of the other ones in Howard County are on their website or not. They don't have to be. Some of it is some of the terminology on a funeral home price list is regulated by the FTC, so um, a lot of it has to be very similar. So you talk about like the basic service fee of the funeral home. That's a standard term. That is the only fee that a funeral home can apply. That is a non-declinable fee. So if a funeral home 
says, you know, they start putting other things on their price on the contract and you don't want it, you can turn, um, decline them. The basic service fee of the funeral home is, is non-declinable. Any other questions? All right, I will stick around till, till the end in case anybody thinks of anything else. And my, our card is in there, so if you think of questions later, feel free to give us a call or send us an email, and we'd be glad to answer any other questions. What I would like to do is talk about what it means to have a funeral here at St. John's. It is not in any way to, dis to answer any questions about any other church, whether it be Catholic or another faith. So it's here to, to talk about what happens here at St. John's. So if that's not germane to you, um, you're still welcome to stay, but just realize that. Um, we're very fortunate here at St. John's. We have a, a resurrection ministry that encompasses helping families at the time of the death of, of a person. And the family will call and tell us that, they, that there's been a death in the family. Sometimes, depending on the length of time the family has been at St. John's, we get the phone call before the funeral director does, and Patrick knows that. Um, I've been the one to have to call the funeral home when there's been a death. That's rare, but it does happen. And again, getting back to that whole planning ahead, um, we do have the opportunity, if you wish, to plan your mass and what you want ahead of time. And we have a folder here of families that have done that. That doesn't mean it's not as binding as doing pre-planning with the funeral home. Changes can be made by your family members later um, at the time of death, if you would like, or you can change it at any time. Um, but it, you can do that, and sometimes, hopefully, that gives your family members the freedom to do other things and not worry about what you want to have, that you've already done that. So um, we have people in the parish uh, that meet with families when the funeral call comes into the office. Um, and we sit down and ask, what is it that you want? Now I'm talking e either way, whether you're pre-planning or whether you're talking about at the time of death, ask the questions, what do you want? You know, are you having a full service with a casket? Are you doing cremation? You know, to get the specifics before we go into further about what we can do for you at that, given those circumstances. Um, yes, we do have the service, the vi visitation here, whether it's the night before and or the morning before the service, uh, the funeral service itself. Uh, we do allow the body to stay overnight here um, if, that's, if, there's, if there's no conflicts with other um, services or anything else going on in the building. But we have done that in the past and never had a problem with any of that. Um, and then the funeral home works with us with what you all want. And, and we've been very fortunate with Patrick, with Slack, and, and, and with, the other funeral home, with the other funeral homes also. Uh, they work with us. Uh, it's interesting working with funeral homes that are not used to coming in here and they're going, so where do you put the casket? And how does that work? Um, but, but it's always encouraging to see other people learn that way. Um, so we sit down with the family and first say, what is it that you want? How can we help you? What, what, what are you looking for? What questions do you have? We find that if we do that first, they tend to listen more to what we have to say about what they can have if their questions are answered ahead of time. And we do the funeral. Um, we go through the mass. You have the choices. Um, if you have the, the urn, we actually have what the, the pall, the, the cloth that's placed over the casket. Um, it, they now have one for the urn. You know, 40 years ago, you couldn't even have the urn in the church. And now they have a, a pall that goes over the urn. Um, and so the choice, if you have the urn, the family can put the pall on before Mass begins 
and not have it be a part of the service, not part of the ritual. Whereas when the casket comes into the, the worship space, the pall is placed on the casket by hopefully, preferably, family members, if not the funeral home, and we work together to do that if, if nobody in the family wants to be involved with that. With the urn, you have the choice of having it placed on the urn prior to Mass or to make it part of the ritual, just because logistically it's easy to do, and if people don't want to do it formally, they can do it before everybody comes in, and the urn will have the pall on, on the urn um, through Mass. And then the choices for Mass. You have the choice of four hymns. You have the opening hymn, the offertory hymn, the communion hymn, and the closing hymn. Sometimes there's a meditation hymn. Um, and if the family wants it, that's fine, especially if there's a large number of people, a, a second hymn after communion is helpful. Um, and then you have the readings, which is the Old Testament reading, the New Testament reading, and the Gospel. The priest would say the gospel. You have the choice of having friends or family members read the Old Testament and New Testament readings. Um, and then the priest would do the homily. And then we do the general intercessions, the prayer of the faithful. And you have choices on, on that. And again, you can have a, another person do that, do that reading. Um, the readers do not have to be Catholic. They should be, hopefully, somebody who's somewhat comfortable at a microphone and will read so that people will have, hear them and, and have a sense of what the reading is. And then, um, then we bring up the gifts, which is the hosts and the wine. If family members want to bring up symbolic gifts for the person, if they were a gardener or whatever, you know, um, if they were an avid reader and you want to bring up a favorite book, whatever um, that might be, the family has the option to do that also, in addition to bringing up the bread and the wine. The people who bring up the gifts do not have to be Catholic. They can bring them up, that's fine. And actually the readers don't, I said that, don't have to be Catholic either. The only place where if you want a family member or a friend involved, as a Eucharistic minister, they have to be not only Catholic, but a trained Eucharistic minister in the Catholic Church. Um, and, but outside of that, not St. John's, Catholic Church, it could be out in Washington State, but, but a, a trained Eucharistic minister. And, um, and, and the Mass goes on, and, and then we have communion. Um, you can, as I said, do the meditation hymn if you choose. The other, one other piece in the Mass that people will ask about is the eulogy. Can we do a eulogy? Do we have to do a eulogy? No, you do not have to do a eulogy. And, and technically, the eulogy is not a part of the Catholic Mass. It's something that has come about. And in years prior to now, it's like traditionally been done after communion. Well, now, it's, it's, the priest says, I want it done now, I want it done. So we have done eulogies um, before Mass begins. We do a eulogy sometimes, Father Bowen likes to, in particular likes to have the eulogy done after the Gospel, but before the homily. He has a very unique knack of being able to retain what he hears and weave it into his homily. We've seen that done, and he, he's good at that. So the priest has some flexibility with that. So if you're in another church, like Patrick was saying, you need to talk to the church to be sure of what you can do, what they require of you. Um, and, and, then, and then we do the final hymn. Sometimes, depending on what you do, we can offer to have the other room available for a luncheon or a reception. And you can do that if, A, the room's available, if there's no other group here um, using it. Um, and I would say that if you're going to a cemetery and then coming back, whether it's here or whether it's a restaurant or your own home, just be conscious of the fact that you, when you're giving a number to the caterer or if you're buying the food yourselves, that you lose people. If you go from church to the cemetery and then the, the reception, you lose people. They're not going to, it's going to be another hour or more, especially depending on where you're going. 
So, but if you do it immediately following, if you have an urn or, or the person, you're taking the person to New York and it's not happening that day and you're doing the reception immediately following mass, yes, then that number is pretty, pretty strong. Um, I would say also that if you are having a visitation, especially the night before and then the mass and you're looking at a number, the number will go down if you give people the choice of two different time frames. You're not going to have everybody show up who shows up that evening before. They're not, chances are they're not going to be there the next morning. If you have a funeral on a Saturday, the chances are you're going to have more people. Um, you're, people are not going to be able to take off from work during the week, but they may very likely show up on a Saturday. Uh, that, that's not talking about your immediate family and your close-knit friends. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the, the outskirt fam friends that you, you may have. Um, I'm trying to think. Are there any questions at the moment? Yes. Sorry. The prayer of the faithful. Um, when you do the specific requests um, for those that are suffering in our world today, we pray, you know, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. So there's usually a generally five of those, um, and we have the suggested list of them. Um, I will tell people that if they want to personalize what we give, that's, that you can do that. If you want to close the script and write your own, you can do that. There's some guidelines for that, but it can be done. Um, to do your own. Again, that's St. John's. That's St. John's. So you just have to, you know, um, know that what I'm talking about is from our perspective here. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, what can and cannot be played? The music, the choices of your music. Um, they're supposed to be liturgical music and not country and western and not Frank Sinatra and you know it, it can't be that it, it can't be that now if you have your visitation here we can do a CD in the background for that but not for mass not for mass and I think you'd find that generally speaking for most churches Irene Okay. Um, when you decide what time and day you want to have Mass, um, and we do try during the week here at St. John's, we have a daily noon Mass, and we do encourage parishioners to join that Mass for the funeral Mass. It is still your Mass, but you are then also with your church family. It's, so it's an extension of that. And we have found that, that people generally respond well to that. Some people say, no, we're too private. Then, you know, the latest we can do a weekday mass would be 10 a.m. Um, and then on Saturday morning, we're more open because we do not have a noon mass. Um, so you have the, the mass, but you have your own selections. Everything that I just went through, you can make that selection. And there's a booklet that we give that has the selections of music and the selections of the hymns. When the call comes in and we meet with the family, we go and we give all the information to the parish secretary. She will get in touch with Chris Euster, our music director, and the musicians will be set up. In the meantime, the family's making their choices of what the music is, and then we coordinate with them and give them your choices of, of music. So, and again, the choices in the booklet are choices and if you have other another passage for an old testament reading that's not listed in the booklet that's fine but it has to your choices have to be old testament new testament gospel and the hymns have to be catholic liturgical music so if there uh, it's a favorite hymn that you have and it's not listed in the booklet you can certainly use that does that answer no. <laughs> okay
Okay. Um, how many people and how, how is the decision made as to who does the music? Um, here at St. John's, like I said, and um, Jan will get in touch with Chris Euster, our music director, and he, he sends out the word to the music ministry. We usually will have a pianist and a, a cantor, a singer, and that's it. But if there are people that are known in the parish, sometimes more people in the choir will come, or if the person went to a particular mass and they choose the musicians that do that Sunday mass, that's, that's, they can do that. Um, if the family has a person in the family or a close friend that wants to be involved in the music, that's fine too. Um, when we do that, we, they say, oh, I want my cousin to do the music, you know, I want her to sing or him to sing. Well, that's fine, but do they do the mass parts on a regular basis in their own parish? I mean, do they know the mass parts? And sometimes you have to have your own cantor, but they can do the, the hymns, and that's, you know, we work with that. We do work with that. And again, that would be the church as to some churches have their, and you pay them directly, and that's that. We're not that way. We have a flat fee that we sometimes is included in the funeral bill and sometimes not. If the family says, I want to pay St. John's directly, then that's fine. And then that's between the family and us. But most times the funeral home, we at least talk with the they talk about. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. So it's, it's between the family and the funeral director and then with us uh, in terms of the cost. So what I'm saying is that the bottom line, the family does not pay the ministers directly, individually. It is included in the fee that the family pays to St. John's. Oh. Any other questions? Yes, Carolyn. That's up to the funeral director, the logistics of that, and the cemetery. That's not me. Okay, that's, that's, but that would be, yeah. A lot of times it's been with the cemetery, because sometimes the cemetery, yeah, you have to get into a certain time. Because of the time of the day. So sometimes that would be good. Say it out loud. Who can pay at the graveside? Um, I have done it. It does not have to be a clergy person. Most times it is. Most times the priest will go with the funeral director and the family to the cemetery. That's when it all follows in a, neatly in a row. If it's going to be done later, you can ask your cousin who's a priest, you can ask a parish priest who wasn't around during, at the time of the funeral to go to the cemetery. Um, there was one year, a few years back, where we didn't, we ended up not getting a, um, an associate, remember? And Father Tillman was here by himself for a year. Um, I did a lot of graveside services that year. <laughs> I've done them. I have done them. But it's, it, the, if the, and the family has to be comfortable with that, you know, um, and, and it worked out. It, it did work out. But I had good support here. And, um, but it does not, it can be anybody. And so if you have somebody that you want to ask to do the prayer service, the, the clergy does not have to go. Yes. No, no, I, no. We have, we had two, we have two caterers that I suggest just because they know the building but I don't know how their prices compare to each other, and I've never gotten into recommending any florist, and I don't know if Patrick has anything. You can do what you want for your funeral, but you have to take it all out of here <laughs> when it's over because we're not allowed, you know, we don't have anything here. So, and it is yours to begin with. I mean, you're welcome to, always welcome to take it whenever you have it and because they're yours. Um, but we ask you specifically to take it out during uh, the Lenten season. Yeah, Diane. Is it true that when Mr. King used to do the 
Yes, yes. The booklet that I have, I don't know if it's still online, but I, that I, we give to the family at the time, and you certainly can come in and get it ahead of time, and I'd be happy to give you a, the booklet, and you can go through that. And as I said, we do have a file here um, at St. John's with people who have done things. So if you have your children or whomever, uh, or a spouse that's not Catholic, and you just have everything in place, um, and that they know that, um, we usually go through it. I, I'm, I, I know who's, the, you know, I know, but you know, they have it here, so they can go through to see if, by chance, you have left any directions here. You can choose the person doing the mass. Um, you know, some people still call Father Tillman and ask him to come, and he has done that on occasion when he's around. Um, and then, but always, you know, if, if Father Ferdinand was the one who would anointed the person and the family wants him, yes, if he's available. It's not, it's not dictate, we don't dictate who does it. It's not like this day, so-and-so does it, and the next day, you know, uh, whoever is available, number one, and whoever you request. And if those two things go in place, then, then that's good. Um, if by chance, and I have said this, especially when it comes to Father, Father Tillman's available this day, but this is available that day, you know, the, the space that they want. I said, but if you want to do it the day Father Tillman, that, you know, I said, what's more important to you, the presider or the room? You know, what's uh, the time, you know, of when you want it? You have to decide because you can't have both. And that doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And you can always ask for any priest, um, whether it's here at St. John's or el elsewhere. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's a person outside of the Baltimore Archdiocese, then we need a letter saying that they're a priest in good standing in the diocese where they are. That's all. Um, and yes, we need to have that. But outside of that, uh, if they're in the, in the Baltimore Archdiocese, it's, it's not a requirement of, of anything in writing. Always. <laughs> you make sure that the funeral home and the church are available at the same time. Yes. And um, we, we are in good communication, I think. And a, a lot of times, um, the, the family and the funeral director have talked, and it's a funeral director that contacts St. John's to see if we're available. And it goes both ways. But there's nothing ever ever made definite until we talk. <laughs> We've also had bagpipes, you know, in the lobby and outside for, you know, ethnic, you know, their, that's their tradition. Um, and because we are so multicultural, we have worked in a variety of ways of um, cultural and uh, music and, and service to adapt to their ways, their, their style of worship. Catholic, but their style of worship. Um, I would say 90% of it is done here. If a family has more regularly worshipped at Oakland Mills and, and wants to go there because that's their place of worship, we will see if it's available. Unfortunately, we do not have the availability as easily at Oakland Mills as we do here. Um, we're 
only a, a small piece of the pie over at Oakland Mills. In this one, we're the majority piece of the pie, so we have more access to this. But sometimes if there is something going on here and room four is available, we may do the, the, the funeral mass over there. And again, if the next day this room's available, they may want, no, we'll just wait another day because we want to be in this room. So uh, it's all about choices. Prices, funeral home prices or church prices? <laughs> okay, I, uh, no, the, at the moment, the total package fee for St. John's is $500. That's it, and we'll take care of the musicians, we'll take, that takes care of everything that happens here is $500. Whether you pay it as attached to the funeral bill or whether you choose to um, pay it directly to St. John's. One of the things is that we do say, which is, I don't think St. If the, the funeral home consists, we do say that price is definitely negotiable. It is um, not a firm thing if someone is not able to or needs to talk about that. We are very, very open to discussing that and that's not a problem. So we've done that and we have other, other families that give more than what we ask for. So it's, it, we have negotiation pieces that we can do, and I don't think that Patrick can say the same. <laughs> and the price list for the funeral home is in his packet, which is on the table outside. You got it? Sure. Mm-hmm. I would say Columbia Memorial Park is probably the most common one, and after that, probably Meadow Ridge. Meadow Ridge was Route 1 and 100. And Elk Ridge. I'm sorry? Oh, oh. Crestline. And the one on St. John's Lane? St. John's Cemetery on St. John's Lane. That's a small one. Oh, sure. You can get your own copy. Be glad to give it to you. <laughs> or to anybody. Any other questions? Thank you. For those who don't know me, I'm Audrey Marsh, and I'm, I um, lead the Gift of Peace ministry here at St. John's. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming, and um, I hope you had a lot of your questions answered. Uh, we've been very fortunate, again, today with our speakers over the last couple years who've been very helpful, and we've received wonderful comments about our speakers, and um, we're very grateful because they come here on their own time and gratis, and um, it's just been wonderful to have the support from the community for this. Um, I want to remind everybody that we have other programs coming up the rest of the year. If you haven't taken the conversation workshop yet, um, we have another offering of that in the spring. We also, and that is your opportunity to come in and just um, relax in a welcoming environment and sit and talk about topics related to your wishes um, at the at the end of your life, the kinds of things that are important to you. And what it does, it's in a small group setting, and what it does is it, it um, helps you formulate conversations that you want to have with your family. Because all of this started um, as part of the Speakeasy campaign run by um, Horizon Foundation with the intent of getting people in Howard County 
to not only have an advanced directive and a um, health agent named to um, carry out their wishes at time of death but, um, or at end of life. So many people say they want to die at home, they die in the hospital. 70% of the people who say they want to die at home die in a hospital. There's all kinds of things that happen. And a lot of it happens because our families are not aware. And so the intent was to give families the opportunity to be aware and carry out those wishes. And so the workshops enable you to formulate your thoughts about that discussion. Gee, how do I want to approach it? Um, and it has you think and formulate yourself. Um, at the last workshop, we received a couple really good recommendations for future events, and um, we're looking into both of those. And one of the, this will be for next year, but one of those is um, having a panel of people um, discussing um, what worked and what didn't work when they had their family conversations. Um, were there any gotchas, things like that. Another one is possibly having, and this, the logistics for this we have to work through, but we are starting to meet um, and figure out how we can do it, but that was an all-day event for families where they can come in and um, do not only the workshop, maybe that panel, and a couple other activities in that one day and give people more time in a more concentrated environment to really think through their wishes. Um, so we are working on that, and if anybody has any thoughts about it, you're very welcome to let us know. Uh, we're always open to recommendations and suggestions for things in the future. We've had, um, probably in the last three years, we've had a good 2,000 people um, some people attending multiple things, but we've had 2,000 seats filled easily in the last three years of people coming to our programs. So there's definitely a need. And um, we also have um, two doctors coming this year. One will talk about um, end of life issues if you have cancer, and one will discuss um, diseases of the brain and brain injuries and um, the types of things you, you need to be aware of for end-of-life care. So, um, and we have Shannon Hammond coming back by popular demand. She's our elder law attorney who is like, everyone just raves about her presentations. They are amazing. And um, there are very few elder law attorneys. There are a lot of attorneys who do wills, but there are very few elder law attorneys around. And we are fortunate to have her come back. This will be her third year. And she has a different topic every year. And this year, it's avoiding probate. But um, I wanted to give you a heads up for the things that are coming up. You can sign up on the website. You can send me an email. Or you can just walk in. Um, we do like, uh, for the workshop, uh, for any of them, it's nice to know that we have enough handouts. But um, walk-ins walk are always welcome. We only have the, the pre-registration to determine handouts and the amount of snacks and food. And at the workshops, we do provide a meal. So um, thank you very, very much for your attention. And your, atten your attendance is very much appreciated.